Big data. Big data. Big data. Big data, it can lead to surveillance on such an unimaginable scale. We're in the era of big data. Massive amounts of information are being collected about us every day from our mobile devices and social media accounts. This is a new kind of digital surveillance, tracking our shopping habits, our daily routines, and everyone we interact with. But what happens to this data? Who can get their hands on it? And what do they do when they get it? How are they using it to target us? We generate more than 2.5 billion gigabytes of data about ourselves every day, from texts and videos to sensors and trackers on smart devices. This information is stored online, and it's up for grabs if you know where to look. One of the companies making use of this information is Neighborly, an online tenant screening service. Neighborly uses your credit and rental data to determine if you pose a risk to landlords, and increasingly, they're using your social media information in their research. I met with Neighborly founder and CEO Dylan Lenz to find out how this data is being used to analyze people. So you actually did an analysis of me. Can yeah, we so this is yours. So this is what your report would have looked like initially. You had like a 79% chance of success because we couldn't verify income, and you were high risk on a couple of things. Well, we look at like 500 different data points. We do a phone record search. We do email identity verification. We look at social media information. What role does social media play in your screening process? We use it to determine misrepresentation. Does this person have a co-applicant that they didn't declare? Do they have a dog they didn't declare on the application? Do they actually work at their job? There's a company in the UK that uses social media data where they just analyze all of the words used in your posts. And these words are like words like broke or poor. And like those are literally what they say are, are words that they use. If people use the word broke a lot or word poor a lot, then they're probably not gonna pay their rent. The fact that people think that that's actually true, I mean, maybe it is true, but there's no world where this company that's been around for six months or eight months has looked at two million data points to actually determine if that's in any way relevant. Well, our company is, trying to be incredibly ethical. Not every company is. When we were approached by these data brokers, they were offering us access to data that basically had people's emails, names, addresses, and the results of every online form they'd ever filled out. And less ethical people might actually start using that data to, to make decisions or, or to classify you. If corporations are looking at our social media posts to determine whether we can pay rent, what other decisions are being made about us with data we don't even know we're sharing? Every time we log on, we're giving out information that could be used against us in the future. There is a further way this data about us can be exploited. I met with Michel Junot Ketsuya, a former senior intelligence officer with CSIS. He has first-hand experience mining people's data. Trained in the art of manipulation, he sees huge potential for abuse of our online data by more than just intelligence agencies. Big data is available not only to the private sector, but it's available to anybody who knows where to look and what to look for. If you're going to look into my data, for instance, what's... Already done. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what sort of thing might I be surprised to, to, to hear that you'd learned about me? There's information about your health profile. There's information about your academic profile. There's information maybe about your spending profile. There's information out there on, on, on maybe even your political orientations. There are definitely tons of information about your friends. People would be very, very surprised how much I can actually, for example, describe your personality, you know? who you are, what you think, what will make you angry or make you sort of react a certain way. And that can be manipulated, ultimately. So this data, it's not only used to, you know, for criminals to, to steal someone's identity and gain access to their bank account or something, but it can also be used to, to create a psychological profile that will allow some pretty profound social engineering. In the hand of somebody who knows how to interrogate, for example, uh, or psychologically manipulate a person, which often we do during an interrogation, I can lead you to do or to think uh, uh, certain ways. And, 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 and that can be extremely powerful. This kind of manipulation is already happening. Advertisers use your data profile to sell you products. Political campaigns use it to sway your vote. And now law enforcement is getting in on the game. Throughout the United States, private companies are offering big data analysis to local police. This is predictive policing. 
automated systems that tell police what parts of the city are most likely to see spikes in crime on an hour-by-hour -hour basis. In 2015, the Saskatoon Police Department began work on a new predictive policing program. They reached out to the Center for Forensic Behavioral Science and Justice Studies. Director Stephen Warmoth saw an opportunity to use the University of Saskatchewan's Advanced Computer Science Program to tackle the job. With big data, we have such a broad range of information that we have access to and are built into you know, the database for analysis. You know, that there, there's the possibility of, of finding patterns that we would never find had we not acquired I mean, those bits of data that we're now, now including. Can you give me an overview of how the program works? We're not doing what, dare I say it, it characterizes predictive policing in the U.S., where they're focusing on what are called hot spots, where to put the cars, where to put the boots on the sidewalk to prevent the crime. Studies have shown that two-thirds of calls to, to you know, police departments are, are not criminal in nature. They're social, they're environmental, they're poverty, they're all kinds of things, mental health related. We want to apply this capacity, this technology, to the potential array of issues that are presented to police. Do you arrest someone? Do you let them go? Do you charge them? Do you bring them? Do you detain them? It, it's an example of how this kind of approach can basically act as a, a decision-making aid. And that's, at the end of the day, all we're trying to do. I wanted to know exactly how this worked, so I spoke to Dr. Daniel Anvari, the man who designs algorithms for the University of Saskatchewan's predictive policing lab. His algorithms sort through people's histories to draw predictions about recidivism, the likelihood that they would commit crimes again in the future. How does this algorithm predict crime? First of all, we are not predicting crime. We are supposed to help those officers to make a better decision, but just giving them better hands on the data. What sort of benefits can we expect to see from the use of such algorithms? I believe the first benefit is for saving time, increasing the efficiency of the police officers. So basically, you, you would answer these questions and it would show you how this uh, persona or this identity yes. that you've entered in compares to similar individuals. Similar individual. And what is the risk of free, uh, recidivism for this specific individual, for this specific crime index? And what you're trying to do is just make sure that, that these data sets most accurately reflect the reality of this exactly. person. Exactly. This is a profile, different categories of the questions. You see which uh, category he got what, what score. Totally, he got 40 score. So that means he is considered as a very high risk for recidivism for this specific crime. This computer program has the power to put someone in jail. Dr. Ann Kavukian, the executive director of the Privacy and Big Data Institute, has been warning people about the way big data is used to profile individuals and the risks this threat poses to our civil liberties. Until very recently, big data has been just assumed to be the machines are pulling this information out, it must be really accurate and we'll just use it. So there was an assumption of accuracy and soundness associated with the outcome. Recently in the United States, the Federal Trade Commission has launched a series of papers on the need for algorithmic transparency. They talk about the tyranny of algorithms. What they've learned is that big data can be discriminatory. Bias can be reflected in the algorithms that will lead to unfortunate results for certain socioeconomic groups, etc. Because as I like to remind people, it's humans coding these algorithms. I mean, humans bring their biases to everything. You have to scratch below the surface and ensure the quality of this and the accuracy. The threat is that human bias can creep into the numbers, creating discrimination in the results. I brought these concerns to the predictive policing team. The potential downside are the data you know, that the algorithm is based on, are, are they biased? And there's a possibility of that. And so the criticism is that the algorithm may in fact build that bias into it, it, its prediction. We're encouraged that the statistical you know, data-based approach is superior to simple human judgment. But there is that caveat that the data have to be good if they're gonna be used you know, without bias. If there is any um, sign of biasness in the, in the output, we can actually check that and go back to adjust the algorithm. It's not a stone-written algorithm. So what sort of checks and balances are in place to be 
monitoring whether the weather biases are appearing. I think the cross validation between different algorithms with one data set would be the best things. Is there ever a limit when when it's it's not desirable to put any more data into it? In, in general, the more information that you have, you can make a better decision. Mm -hmm. That's a solid fact, actually. So I don't think data is harmful. The way of we present it or analyze the data might be bad or mm -hmm. might be wrong or might be risky, but data by itself, information by itself, is always helpful. Our personal data is valuable, and everyone wants to get their hands on it, from law enforcement to government to corporations. But there's very little information about how this data is being used to profile and exploit us. What rights do we lose as individuals in the wake of these technologies? I'm going to take a look at the ways people are exposing these invasive tools and finding ways to regain control of their personal data.